in, everybody, to another retro review in this SummerSlam retro review series. As always, this is the Club of the Man, 1993, and I believe we're on number, let me see here, I think 15 now? The 15th edition of SummerSlam. So we're pretty much about halfway done here, because I keep saying I'm going to do just SummerSlams 1988 to 2016 since I already did a live review of um, Summer Slam 2017 last year and again I said that show was not that great I don't really want to go back and watch it again but um but getting off that subject everybody just wanted to remind us again since we were just about halfway through this retro review series um we are on now SummerSlam 2002 one of the Summer Slams that I was looking forward to watching definitely especially with the one match that you know everybody said this Summer Slam is most notably known for I mean a few others as well but this one as well has the one match that, you know, people probably at the time, like a few years earlier, may not have thought this match ever would happen or this guy would ever return to the WWE ring at all because of his, um, you know, career ending back injury that he had. But we'll talk about that when we get later on. 2002 also was the year where the WWF was no longer a thing. It was now just the WWE because of, you know, the world wide fun or world wildlife fun or whatever heck it was called and also when it became the WWE, it also introduced the brand split so we had raw and smackdown separate brands pretty much not everyone was on the same show it was just superstars were on their own brands because of probably you know the stacked talent they had um and what i like about this show also is the fact that it did you did feel that sense of competition between the brands as well some i feel we i wish we would get a little bit more um, today, well, we kind of got it with Money in the Bank last night a little bit, but I feel like you know, there needs to be some more storylines with competition in between the brands. I feel like we had a little bit of that in this show. But my opinion, like so far, after I got to watch Summer Slam 2013 again, but this may be either the best or the second best Summer Slam, I feel, in my opinion, of what we could eventually end up getting um, after at the end of all these results, because this show was awesome. You know, the, the, the talent was stacked, and there are a bunch of guys, you know, who were, you know, like, like Kurt Angles or more on a main event level now. You know, Chris Jericho was still around at the time. You know, his booking was not really the best after he dropped this Undisputed Championship. Um, you know, Rick, this is Rick Flair as well. It was Rick Flair's first SummerSlam as a competitor since he was at SummerSlam 1992. He wasn't in the match, he was just in the corner of, um, you know, well, outside for outside interference on either Warrior or Savage. I believe that was the match, if I remember correctly, at 1992 SummerSlam. Uh, but he, this is the first time he ever had a match. Um, we had RVD, Chris Benoit, um, of course, the one match, the unsanctioned match I want to talk about later on. Of course, the main event, the the Rock and Brock Lesnar. Also, the talent was stacked big time, as we now are transitioning to more so the ruthless aggression era. Um, so we're getting John Cena, you know, JBL, main event status, Batista, and several others, Randy Orton also as well. So we'll definitely talk, have a lot to look forward to. But let's talk about SummerSlam 2002. So again, I said this is probably either the best or the second best SummerSlam of all time, I feel my opinion. So this SummerSlam took place on August 25th, 2002 at the, the, the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Uniondale, New York. The opening match was a really great match that I enjoyed. I feel like it, it, is, it is a hidden gem in my opinion. Kurt Angle taking on Rey Mysterio. This is Rey Mysterio's first SummerSlam also on this show. And I was not disappointed by this match at all. This match, in my opinion, was one, not the best, of course, but I'd say maybe the third or fourth best match on this show. This match was was a lot of fun. You know, at the beginning of the match, you know, Mysterio didn't come down the ramp, came up in, in from behind Angle to start attacking him. You know, as I said, last year's SummerSlam, you know, that's when Angle more so made, cemented himself as a main eventer. And Rey Mysterio is an upcoming upstart. You know, he's a small guy, but, you know, he was meant to be a main eventer as well. Um, and Angle, again, you know, just being a main eventer. But even though um, he beat Mysterio by a submission, I still felt he made Mysterio look like a million bucks in this match. It was a really good match. The back and forth action, you know, it didn't make, Myster make it look like, you know, Angle had to, you know, take it easy or have Mysterio look like they're both going all out. You know, I, I, did, I enjoy it. Again, in my opinion, it's a hidden gem. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's Rey Mysterio's you know, first match um, in on SummerSlam, and he, he faced a guy like Kurt Angle, who literally made him look like a million bucks despite him him losing. Again, it, it, he just it, it, he, both these guys just shine big time in this match. It's definitely you know one of the more hidden gems, underrated matches I definitely feel that I've seen so far. So a great opener between Rey Mysterio and Kurt Angle to start off the show. We then had a backstage segment with Stephanie McMahon um, going into the 
GM's office, and Eric Bischoff, the Raw GM, is there since Stephanie's a GM of SmackDown at this time. Um, so they agreed to you know share uh, the GM's um, office and watch SummerSlam together, and you know see what happens. So this is pretty much you know just one of those those basic promos. Um, then we had a sec our second match was Chris Jericho taking on Ric Flair, and it looked like uh, Jericho was the heel and and Flair was the face. This match was not bad. It was like decent, the solid I felt. Wasn't really one of the best matches I've really seen between the two of them. I mean, again, like this is a time where, you know, Jericho was being booked like crap after he won the Undisputed Championship. Because I know apparently they didn't really have any intention of making Jericho, you know, a big a big deal at all in the WWE at all. But then he they, they gave him, you know, that spot to be on top of the mountain. And he just, it went downhill from there for him pretty much. Um... Um, Jericho tried using his figure, the figure four submission on Flair, did not work out. Flair would end up winning the match though later on, um, uh, after he, um, you know, even though he's the bay face pulling, you know, the dirtiest player of the game tactics, when the referee wasn't looking, he struck Jericho where the sun does not shine, and he put him into the figure four leg lock, got him to tap out. Of course, there's also a spot though, when, when, uh, Flair was in the figure four leg lock by, by Jericho, where Flair grabbed onto the rope, but he started tapping out with his other hand after he grabbed the rope. But he grabbed the rope first, the referee couldn't call it a submission, even though Jericho was freaking out about it. But um, but yeah, so so Ric Flair wins the match again. It was decent to solid, but I definitely know these two put on a little bit better match than what we saw. Um, so we had that match. Then we had ah, this was another fun match, another very underrated match. I feel um. Edge and Eddie Guerrero. I believe Eddie Guerrero was this feud was having because Eddie Guerrero was you know jealous of the you know the, the attention Edge Edge against for his look or something I can't remember. Um, but the um, but you know of course the story here also was was Eddie Guerrero just you know trying to you know uh, hurt the shoulder of Edge because he you know he knows Edge's bread and butter finisher is the spear. Um, so he played psychology on on the shoulder. For most of the match, and then of course, you know, Edge was trying to you know fight out of it, just, you know, even though he was continuously showing selling that he was in pain from the shoulder injury. Um, and I thought it was just good back for that again between two guys who were you know still kind of on the upstart level. I mean, the, I think it's only the second SummerSlam we see Eddie Guerrero since the SummerSlam a couple years ago when him and um, um, China were teaming up against um, Val Venus and Trish Stratus, and that's when um, China won the Intercontinental Championship. Um, so this is only Guerrero's second SummerSlam and first as a singles competitor. And if I had a good showing, definitely Eddie did. Um, and then, of course, you know, Edge, you know, again, he, who's been, was, this is only his second ma uh, singles match um, because he's been in, you know, the match with um, Sable and um, Sable, with Sable against the, against a team of Jacqueline and Mark Miro. And he also was in, you know, the first TLC uh, tag to title match at SummerSlam with the Dullies and the Hardys. So like he, last year he faced um, Lance Storm for the IC title. Um, this year he was you know now in a one on one match with Eddie Guerrero. So again you know, another great showing here by Edge definitely you know showing how the big upcoming star he was. And he still have a couple years so until he capitalized on him being a main eventer though. So he won his first world championship after he was cashing he cashed in his money in the bank contract. But we'll get to that in a couple more more Summer Slams. But it was another really good match. Edge won by pinfall after spearing. Eddie, though. I mean, it would have been nice to see, you know, Edge try something else since Eddie played good psychology, again, on his shoulder, uh, but it didn't stop Edge, even though he's still, because he's still being with the spear. So I would like to maybe see him try to do something just a little bit different, but it was still a great match, and I don't want to take away from that. So uh, Edge wins by hitting the spear. Then we have a tag team match for the WWE Tag Team Championships. It was the Un-Americans, Christian and Lance Storm, taking on a team of Goldust and Booker T, which a lot of people thought when Goldust and our truth formed the Golden Truth, people thought that they were trying to, you know, duplicate that. And again, I've, this is the only match I've seen Goldust and Booker T, you know, team up. And I thought they they worked well, pretty pretty, pretty well together. I mean, it was, it was random, but I thought they worked well together. Of course, the Un-Americans being people who just typically just hates America, they're Canadian or whatnot. Um, of course, again, I'm not sure again storyline wise if. Christian formed an alliance with Lance Storm since Edge feuded with Lance Storm uh, last year or anything. So I had to go back and look or refresh my memory to see what happened at uh, WrestleMania 18 again. I mean, I remember some things, not everything WrestleMania 18, of course. But um, for the most part, it, it was just a good, like, you know, good tag match that you would expect. Not like, you know, decent or anything. It was good. Um, it was just, you know, the, the guys just did, did, did their job. Um, you know, um, Goldust is in for most of the match. So forever to get the hot tag on Booker T. 
But um, I thought, you know, the heels played their role really well. And um, the match ended, though, whenever um, Tess came out, the other member of the Un-Americans. He came out off the distraction, and he hit a big boot. I believe it was on, um, I think it was Booker, yeah, Booker T. And um, and um, I think and um, one of them, I, think it was, I can't remember if it was a Storm or Christian, snuck in to pin them for the victory. Even the referee didn't see it. The referee also did not see a tag made by, by Goldust onto R-Truth, though, um, sometime during the match also, which, which caused for Goldust to stay in the match a little bit longer than he had, you know, anticipated himself as a character. Um, but still, you know, good tag match. Uh, the Un-Americans, though, retained the tag titles, though, over Goldust and Booker T. Then we had some segment where Nydia uh, made out with a random dude that she picked out in front of Jamie Noble. It was weird. Um, we had Eric Bischoff and Stephanie Man talking about the upcoming IC title match as it was, you know, um, Chris Benoit, SmackDown Superstar, taking on a Raw Superstar in RVD. And we got that match next. It was um, Chris Benoit, the champion, taking on RVD for the WWE Intercontinental Championship. This match was good. I mean, you know, most matches involving Chris Benoit are really good. RVD as well. The problem, though, with this match that didn't make it, that gave it a little bit lower of, like, a rating, in my opinion, is the fact that RVD didn't get too much offense in, in this match. Like, you know, yes, you know, Chris Benoit looked dominating. But, you know, RVD, you know, he's definitely, you know, has his dominating side as well. And I feel like they didn't quite show that in this match completely. RVD you know, did eventually, though, sneak in, in the window with a five-star a shooting star, five star frog splash, forever. They call his finisher again to get the victory and uh, become the new Intercontinental Champion. Which you know, okay, cool. Again, you know, the match was still good for what it was, but it could have been better. I felt if RVD got got more offense in than he did. Um, backstage, of course, Bischoff is bragging to Stephanie about, but she just laughs it off and leaves. So that was the last we saw of them that them uh, for the show. Uh, we then had Test, the third member of the Americans, taking on the Undertaker who was the American Badass at the time. Match was decent. wasn't anything too special. Again, Tess was someone that they definitely tried to make, you know, more of like more of a bigger deal than he was, but he just never really got to the level, that level at all. Um, so, I mean, he was forced to still suck like you know, a big car position. Um, and, you know, he did American, Undertaker was the American Badass to get a good USA pop pretty much. He beat... Um, uh, Tess, despite, you know, Lance Storm and Christian try to interfere, did not work. Those are trying to use chairs on Undertaker, take her out of the way. The chairs hit each other's chairs, um, and which eventually led to uh, Taker taking um, Tess and hitting him with, with, a to with, with a tombstone pile driver to pick up the victory. Again, decent match, probably the weakest on the card, but not too bad. Of course, this was the biggest reason why I could not wait to watch this show. It was because of this next match. The unsanctioned match between Triple H and the returning Shawn Michaels. This was the first SummerSlam for Shawn Michaels since 1997. Because at Royal Rumble 1998, he suffered a back injury. He did wrestle at um, WrestleMania 14 that year still. But that was pretty much his, um, his, his like, you know, swan song at the time. That was, that was his last match in WWE. He thought, well, the WF, he thought it could be. Four years later, though, he, um, you know, was may have a chance. And this wasn't, this. they didn't have like, a long-term plan for Shawn Michaels at the time. If you watch the rivalries, which I might watch it again on the WWE Network, the thing between Shawn Michaels and Triple H, like the backstory of their storyline. Um, I'll check that in a second. Um, so, so, um, I, cause it's really it's supposed to be just a one-off thing, just to get, get Shawn one more match and see what, we, what he, could, he could do. Um, and that story, you know, led up, you know, Triple H, you know, turning on Shawn Michaels when he was being teased to be coming back, um, saying that, you know, he just used Shawn Michaels to become successful because he knew who, how great Shawn Michaels was. But now that Shawn Michaels was gone, he felt that he surpassed him. And, of course, you know, obviously Triple H feels threatened by Shawn Michaels possibly coming back. He did some vicious beatdowns, including, you know, throwing his, him into a car window, which, you know, at first it was a mystery of who did it. And then it's shown on the Titan Tron, clears as as clear it could be, or clear as crystal, I should say, that it was Triple H who, um, you know, um, pushed Shawn Michaels into into that 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 car window. Shawn Michaels speed up, but he said he'd be ready for SummerSlam, and he wanted to, you know, take it all out there. And of course, it was on sanctions. That way, you know, anything that happens to Shawn Michaels, WWE would not be held responsible for it. And the match, man, 
used weapons. It was brutal. There was blood in there. Well, mainly on Triple H. Um, you know, the, the sledgehammer was teased several times. Several great, you know, stuff going th through through the table. Shawn Michaels had, had, had a single elbow drop on uh, Triple H as well. Uh, steel steps were used. Garbage cans. To me, if I, I mean, the site that I, like, you know, read the critics those for, I don't think anybody would rate it as, as a classic. I mean, I can see why, because, you know, they had more matches down the line. This was still, in my opinion, on the level of being a classic. It told us a great story there, but, you know, does Shawn Michaels, like, have what it takes still? Like, can he be on that level? And he was, and he showed he has not lost a beat at all in this match at all. Now, he did not win with the sweet chin music. He was setting up for it on Triple H towards the end, but Triple H grabbed his foot, and Sean just like you know rolled him up and just did like a, a schoolboy roll a pin fault pin on him to get the victory. After the match though, Triple H attacked Shawn Michaels with a sledgehammer, hitting him in the back and then and then right in like the back of the neck like right here. And it was pretty much just you know continue on the feud pretty much. I believe a couple months later he won an elimination chamber match for the championship off of Triple H. I believe was the case on Raw. Um, I could say hey. Several other matches down the line against each other. This was just the first match of a big rivalry and the start of Shawn Michaels' second run with the WWE since coming back. And this match showed you did not miss a beat at all. I love this match. Again, I have been wanting to see this match for a long time. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do the SummerSlam Review Series. So to me, it's a classic. It's awesome. I loved it. And I do recommend you guys checking out this match as well. Shawn Michaels versus Triple H in the unsanctioned match at SummerSlam 2002. Again, Shawn Michaels wins, but unfortunately suffers a brutal assault for the sledgehammer from Triple H afterwards. Then we had this segment with Howard Finkel bragging about his commitment, how he, you know he's been these events at the Coliseum since WrestleMania 2 and whatnot, uh, before he's interrupted by Trish Stratus. And I'm sorry, but... Dang, did I wish I was Howard Finkel being in a ring with Trish Stratus. Holy hell, does she look hot as hell. Um, she came out and she pretty much started, you know, fake flirting with with the Fink, even though she had, you know, sliding across the face. I forgot what she said she did, you know, the other time too. But she says, let's start with this, like, you know, a hug or take it slow here. We thought she was going to, like, you know, plant one on him or whatnot. But um, she didn't because it was a setup for Lillian Garcia just to give Finkel a low, a low blow pretty much. I'm not sure what the story was behind it. But poor Fink, all I gotta say to But, you know, of course, Trish just looked fine as hell, I shall, I shall say. Whoa! Then we had the main event. It was The Rock, the champion, taking on Brock Lesnar with Paul Heyman for the WWE Undisputed Championship. This is uh, Brock Lesnar's first SummerSlam as well. Brock got this opportunity also because he won the King of the Ring this year. And the stipulation was whoever won King of the Ring would get a WWE Undisputed Championship shot at SummerSlam. Which, thank you for actually having a tournament mean something like, like, like they did. Um, of course, you know, Paul Heyman, you know, was, you know, you know, he's an advocate now. But I felt he, in this in this match, he was trying to be, you know, a little get a little bit more involved in the match than, than he would today. Um... But you know, I enjoyed I enjoyed this match definitely. I was surprised also because for most like until like towards the end, but three quarters of the match, not many people were sounding like they were behind the Rock. It was a mixed reaction. People wanted Lesnar, people wanted Rock. I mean, I get you know Rock is great. But I feel like you know at the time they were they were starting to want something a little fresh here, and you know Brock Lesnar was you know the next big thing and a fresh product there as well. Um, one of my favorite spots of the match also is wherever you know. Um, uh, Rock polishes off like the ring post, and he like you know does the thing where he like you know, wheelbarrows you know your opponent into the ring post. Brock just went flying in the air, and I, I, I really thought they were, they were going to put, put a little bit of blood in there after taking that, that 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 bump off of the ring post with his head. Like he just flew into him. Of course, he saw several other moves by the Rock as well. Um, the Rock also rock bottom Paul Heyman through the table. Brock tried pulling a, a rock bottom on the Rock on the rock as well but it did not work and and brock kicked out of the rock bottom as well and eventually the match would end after um you know brock let's try to get one f5 on the rock rock out of the way he tried to hit another rock bottom but it didn't work out either and then brock would hit yet another f5 though to get the victory and win the undisputed wwe championship the reigning defending undisputed wwe champion of the world barack lesnar wins the match of course you know he would be around next year probably the year after nope because he left WWE in 2004 after that horrible match with Goldust at Wrestlemania 20 but we're not going to talk about that um but yeah that's it guys 
this was a great show. I mean, the weakest match I thought was Undertaker and Test. It was decent, but this show was awesome. I recommend go watch it. I give it an A. That's my grade. I mean, I will almost gave it an A plus, but there's a couple matches I want to see just a little bit more from, and it would have probably received an A plus. But this pay per view deserves an A. Great show. Has a classic in there. You know, a couple other good matches from you know Rock and Lesnar, and also Mysterio and Angle. I love this show, and of course, some pretty good moments. Good moment there with Trish Stratus. Man, I couldn't deny. I, w I wish I was fake. But guys, that is it. What are your thoughts on SummerSlam 2002? Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. And be sure as always to click my like and subscribe when we're coming to this channel. And follow me on Twitter at DemandAirBoy93. And until then, guys, I will see you all later. Until, until then, guys, have a good day. Peace out, everybody.